In a world where money talks, we rarely hear about people turning down incredible amounts of money for something they own. But there are those who believe that their properties hold more value than what can be measured in dollars. In this video, we'll take a look at real estate holdouts who refuse to give up their properties. From the Edith Macefield house to a house cutting off a highway, here are 20 owners who refuse to move out at any price. Number 20. Edith Macefield House Imagine fighting so hard for your property that you inspired a blockbuster kids movie into creation. This is the story of Edith and her 108-year-old farmhouse, which she refused to sell until her very last breath. She began getting worldwide attention in 2006 for being a real estate holdout. But her ordinary life is as interesting as her holdout story. Edith Macefield was born in Oregon in 1921. She was passionate about learning languages and could speak French, German, and other languages fluently. Despite being underage, she secretly joined the military and was sent to England, where she was promptly dismissed after being found out. She then stayed in England to care for war orphans before returning home to care for her mother and work at Washington Dental Service. Macefield had four marriages, all in Europe, and outlived her last three husbands and only child for many years. For most of her life, she lived in the farmhouse where her family stayed for over a century. And so, when she was offered money to sell the house to make way for commercial development in the neighborhood, she vehemently refused. Despite being offered an increasing amount of money, Macefield stood firm and refused to leave her home. She continued to live in her family home until she died at age 86 on the same couch where her mother died back in 1976. She was buried beside her mother in Evergreen with Shelley Cemetery in Seattle. Macefield's story inspired many people. After her passing, she left her home to Barry Martin, the construction superintendent of the new building, as a token of appreciation for his friendship and care. To this day, the house stands tucked in between the tall five-story buildings in the Ballard neighborhood. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now. Number 19 the Red House It's easy to see this house sticking out like a sore thumb. Most housing projects in neighborhoods have uniform colors and uniform layouts to make everything look more alike. And so this family's home sticks out among the bland colored houses in this area. This house is located in a suburban area in Sydney, Australia. The family stuck to their guns and kept their dream home, despite being offered millions of dollars by developers. The Zamet family's two-hectare property in the pond stands out in the middle of a sea of hundreds of houses, but they're not budging. While it's unclear how much they've been offered, it's safe to say they've likely been given some big checks. However, they're determined to keep their beloved home, and a local real estate agent has praised their decision. But the Zamet family and their neighbors are happy to stay put and enjoy the lush lawn, triple garage, and stunning views of the Blue Mountains. The neighbors are so happy that they've said they don't want the family to sell, as they enjoy living in the cul-de-sac. It seems like a win-win situation for everyone involved, except the developers who are fighting a losing battle. Number 18. The Narrow House The Narrow House, also known as the Mary Cook House, has an incredibly fascinating story dating back to the 1900s. It was built in the 1890s by architect Clarence Fagan True. It was part of a row of five houses designed to imitate a single building with a unified base. The middle houses had two-story bowed undulating facades above the first floor that created third-floor balconies. In the early 1900s, the Cook family purchased the house and called it home. The family was renowned in the early social circles, with Ferdinand Hunting Cook being the director of the New York College of Dentistry and Mary Cook a member of the Daughters of the Revolution. Their five children were living a comfortable life, until the night of January 3, 1913. Ferdinand left the house during a severe windstorm and never returned home. Mary searched for him and discovered he had passed away one month earlier. Despite the tragedy, Mary Cook remained in the house, sending her children to college and hosting social events. The neighborhood was changing, however, and modern apartment buildings were replacing row houses. Mary was approached with an offer to sell, but refused to let go of her home. The houses to the north of the Cook family home were demolished and replaced by an apartment building in 1916. Mary Cook held her ground, but her house became an anachronism, a relic from the past sandwiched between the pages of the present. In 1924, the
The remaining houses on the block to the south were demolished, and another gigantic building was erected. Mrs. Ferdinand Hunting Cook passed away in May 1932, and the historical townhouse continued to stand amidst the towering giants. Today, it sits tightly squeezed between its giant neighbors, looking much like an illustration from a children's storybook. To this day, the land value in the area continues to rise, but I think the narrow house will remain there for decades. Number 17. The Vera Coking House Vera Coking was a determined woman who held her ground against powerful businessmen for years, all to keep her beloved home on South Columbia Place in Atlantic City. Vera bought her home in the 1960s for a mere $20,000. I know, that's an insane amount compared to the crazily steep prices of real estate properties nowadays. Inflation is real, folks. Anyway, Bob Guccione, founder of Penthouse Magazine, eyed the place around Vera's house. He wanted to build his penthouse boardwalk hotel and casino. He offered Vera $1 million for her property. Vera, who had lived in her home for decades and had no desire to leave, refused the offer. This did not deter Guccione, who went ahead and built a steel structure around Vera's home. However, due to a lack of funding, the hotel and casino remained unfinished for years, leaving Vera's home stranded in the middle of a construction site. In 1984, Harris at Trump Plaza opened, and in 1989, Donald Trump purchased the unfinished penthouse casino project for $62 million. By 1993, Trump Plaza was planning a significant expansion, but Vera's home was still in the way. Trump offered to buy Vera's house, but again she refused. Legal battles ensued, including attempts to use eminent domain to take her home, but Vera remained steadfast. In 2010, Vera transferred ownership of her home to her daughter and attempted to sell it for $5 million, which was later reduced to $1 million. Eventually, the property was sold for $583,000 in an auction in July 2014. The buyer was none other than Carl Eichen, who by that time owned Trump Plaza. He decided to demolish Vera's home that same fall. Although her home is no longer standing, Vera's case and the way she fought for her home remain popular to this day. Number 16. The Half House in Toronto Now let me tell you about this fascinating house that looks like it's been photoshopped. Believe me, this actual house exists in Toronto, Canada. It's not a fake image or a maliciously constructed house, but rather a bona fide half house that has withstood the test of time despite experiencing damages and changes in zoning regulations. The building, situated at 54 and a half St. Patrick Street, was constructed in the late 19th century when Toronto was full of slums. It was one of six row houses on Dummer Street, all of which were structurally interconnected. However, over time, the street names changed, and a land holdings company began buying up properties in the neighborhood. Eventually, the owners of the row houses gave in and sold, and little by little, the houses were dismantled, except for 54 and a half. Now you may be wondering how half a building could be removed so cleanly without damaging the rest of the structure. The answer lies in careful planning and precise machinery. A demolition crew was able to remove 54 and a half's northern neighbor with such accuracy that none of the original facades on the remaining building were harmed. The white exterior wall once served as a load-bearing wall that separated the neighbor's bedrooms and living spaces. One wrong move with the excavator and the half house would have crumbled. According to reports from 2013, the house was privately owned and occupied. However, as time passed, the building began to show signs of aging, and its status as a relic from the neighborhood's less desirable days became more apparent. Number 15. French Coffee Cafe The story behind this house is a tale of resilience and determination that takes place in Rabai, a city in northern France. Salah Ujani, a 71-year-old business owner, has been running a triangular coffee house for the past 46 years. Despite being the only standing building in a neighborhood that has long been demolished, Ujani refuses to sell. The story of Salah Ujani is not just about his attachment to his coffee house, but also his strong connection to the neighborhood. Originally from Algeria, Ujani moved to France in 1949 and worked hard for many years before buying the Café Chez Salah building with his wife in 1965. Throughout the 70s, the streets of Rubai were bustling with life, and Ujani's café was a popular spot for locals. It was a better time when people were happier and enjoyed life more. Inside the café, 
You can still find old jukeboxes, yellowed photos, and postcards on the walls that tell the stories of those days. When you visit, not only do you receive a drink, but you'll probably hear a few tales from the good old days from Ujjani as well. For Ujjani, his cafe is not just a business. It's a reflection of his life and memories. I will die here, he said. Over the years, Ujjani has received multiple offers for his property, but he has consistently refused to sell it. Despite being the only building left in the neighborhood, Ujjani refuses to budge. I will not sell, he says. I work for it, this coffee house. They will not make me go, and I'm used to pressure. Even when the neighborhood was bought by developers and demolished to make way for the new Union Eco District, Ujjani remained steadfast in his decision to stay put. His phone, gas, and power have been occasionally cut off, and garbage trucks no longer stop by his place. But he keeps sending pints of beer and cups of coffee as if nothing happened. For developers, Ujjani's coffee house is a hindrance to their plans. It's located right at the junction of two axes the city is trying to rehabilitate, and construction would go a lot smoother without that building in the way. But they've come to the conclusion that the man to convince Allah Ujjani to move hasn't been born yet. They have even altered their plans to include the old 60s cafe since they can't force him to give up his property. The developers hope that Ujjani's descendants will be more easily convinced to sell in the future. Number 14. The DC Man Who Turned Down a $3 Million Offer Austin Spriggs is a man who refused to sell his downtown Washington row house to developers for years despite waves of lucrative offers. The land around his property was being bought out left and right with many property owners cashing in on the sudden riches that came with the sale. But not Spriggs, who owned the peeling brick building and used it for his architecture firm. Despite the wads of money that were offered to him, which eventually reached up to a staggering $3 million, the house owner stood firm and refused to sell. Other landowners around him pleaded with him, warning that his defiance would only lead him to losing money in the end. But Spriggs held out. Spoiler alert, it was the wrong decision. In 2003, developers came knocking with offers of up to $3 million with plans to build condos and offices. But Spriggs refused, and his building became the last holdout in the area. As construction began around him, his building was perched on the edge of a four-story pit. However, as time passed, it seemed Sprigg had blown his chance. Four years after those first offers, he was in foreclosure and trying to sell for $1.5 million. In 2011, the property finally sold for just under $800,000. It was admirable for Spriggs to hold on to the familiar building he grew to like, but in the end, he lost more than he gained. What do you think? Do you think he was better off selling the house when the price point offered to him was still steep? Let me know about your thoughts in the comments down below. Number 13. Life in Between the Motorway Liang is a stubborn homeowner in Guangzhou, China and she's one of the few homeowners who garnered the attention of the entire world for her refusal to sell her property. Despite offers of compensation and alternative housing options, Liang held out for a decade, leading to the construction of a motorway bridge around her one-story house. She claimed that all of the compensation and flats offered to her weren't adequate, and that she'd rather stay in her home than accept the government's relocation offers. While the bridge has brought constant traffic and noise to Liang's once quiet neighborhood, she remains steadfast in her decision. She insists that she feels quiet, liberating, pleasant, and comfortable in her home. I don't know about you, but I don't think being the only house in the middle of the motorway is relaxing. Although the Chinese government had earmarked the plot for demolition as far back as 2010, it took a decade before they were able to complete the bridge thanks to Liang's refusal to sell. Despite government officials claiming they had offered Liang compensation and alternative housing options, she remained uninterested in their offers. Number 12. Straight at the center of the highway. Luo Baogen lived in a five-story row house in the middle of a new main road in Wenling, a city in eastern China's Zhejiang province. The house is the only one left standing from a neighborhood that was demolished to make way for the new road that leads to a newly built railway station. As I've said, the homes that remain standing during these clashes are called nail houses, named after the nails that refuse to be hammered down. The situation can sometimes escalate to violence, with homeowners resorting to setting themselves on fire or keeping 24-hour vigils in their homes to prevent bulldozers from destroying them. In Luo's case, 
He and a few neighbors are still holding out for better compensation. Luo and his wife are the only ones left in their village of 1,600 who have refused to accept the government's compensation offer of $41,000 and vacate their home. They're holding out for a new home on a two-unit lot with simple interior decoration. Local authorities in China often take extreme measures, such as cutting off utilities or moving in to demolish homes when residents are out for the day. Luo's electricity and water are still flowing and he and his wife sleep in separate parts of the house to deter any partial demolition. In the end, however, Luo accepted the compensation of around $41,000, and the house was bulldozed immediately. Number 11. The Truth Behind the Ken House It's definitely strange to see a farm smack bang in the middle of the M62, and those who pass by the area often wonder why the farm wasn't demolished upon the road's construction. The M62, the highest motorway in Britain, stretches across the desolate, rugged Pennine Mountains between Lancashire and Yorkshire. However, around 20 miles northeast of Manchester, the highway splits into eastbound and westbound lanes, and right in the middle of the narrow strip of grass is the only farm in the UK that sits in the middle of a highway, the Stott Hall Farm. The story goes that since 1737, the area has been home to sheep and other farm animals. Over the centuries, a family took care of the place. And so, when the government contacted them to buy the area to make way for the development of the M62, the farmer, Ken Wilde, vehemently refused and stubbornly stayed on the farm. It turned out, however, that the truth is much more mundane than the famous backstory. According to Ken Wilde's granddaughter, Kimberly Pollard, the farm had to be built around the house due to a geological fault that made it impossible to dig in the area. Today, Stott Hall Farm remains a unique site, nestled between the speeding traffic on either side of the M62. It's become something of a landmark and a talking point for drivers, and the story of its construction continues to intrigue those who pass by. While the actual story may be less dramatic than the legend, Stott Hall Farm is still an amazing property. Number 10. Randall Acker House Randall Acker, a lawyer in Portland, Oregon, owns a Queen Anne Victorian house that many people believe looks like the cottage from Pixar's movie Up. When the city attempted to demolish the house, Acker won the legal battle to keep it standing. To celebrate, he recreated a famous scene from the movie by tying dozens of colored balloons to the roof of his house. The house is now used as Acker's law office and as a standout property on the edge of downtown Portland. Acker purchased the home in 2005 for $380,000. In 2007, four other Victorian houses surrounding Acker's were demolished to build Portland State University's $90 million college station. However, when the city attempted to purchase Acker's house as well, he refused to sell it. And so it still stands to this day. Number 9. House in the Middle of the Ring Road Ring around the rosy, there's a whole community in the middle of this road. This newly built ring viaduct was built in Guangzhou, Guangdong province in China. You can guess what happened here. Several apartment tenants refused to move out of the building, and with no compensation or compromise accepted, the developers had to find a way to retain the building. It made vehicles drive a longer way, but hey, at least the tenants never needed to leave their homes. Number 8. Last Village Standing in Yangji, Guangdong province in China, several villagers fought for their centuries-old village in the face of bulldozers, powerful developers, and the top percentile on the social triangle of the country. To protect their village, the people created a ditch to prevent bulldozers from reaching their homes. The village has a history of more than 900 years and has housed over 1,400 families. No wonder its people were trying hard to protect it. Number 7. The Million Dollar Corner If you live in the Big Apple, there's a huge chance you've already seen this building. The Million Dollar Corner, a small building tucked next to Macy's Herald Square at 1313 Broadway. Macy's Herald Square in New York has had this small building for 120 years. It all began with a retail war in 1900 when Macy's moved to 34th Street, and the owner of the world's largest store at the time, the Siegel Cooper Company, attempted to take over Macy's old lease by offering $375,000 for the small corner building. Macy's had only offered $250,000, but refused to negotiate, causing the owner to sell to Robert Smith. Macy's built around the building to spite them, creating the unique architecture seen today. 
Number 6. The Saloon The Thirsty Beaver Saloon is a quaint dive bar that serves bottled beer with old country music playing in the background. It looks like something straight out of an old movie, but despite its outdated aesthetic, its owner has held onto the property for years. In 2017, the salon owner was offered money for the property, but of course, the owner refused. In the end, the saloon was surrounded on three sides by several new multi-story high-rise buildings that have over 300 apartments. Number 5. The Nani Nail House This residential block in Nanning, South China looks like an ordinary neighborhood, until you walk into this section of the road where a nail house sits right in the middle. This is one of the most obtrusive nail houses in the nation. The nail house is the last one sitting in the area, with the owner refusing to move despite being surrounded by newly built high-rise buildings. Number 4. Final Resting Place A family in China refused to move their loved one's remains from a cemetery when a construction company began building a new high-end residential complex last year. The developers offered to pay the villagers to relocate the remains, but the family of Chang Jingju refused to accept the compensation, claiming that it was too low. Later on, however, it was reported that Jinju's family finally reached an agreement with the construction consortium. They received a compensation of 800 yuan, which is about $128. The family also had a platform and bridge built to the gravesite, and the four coffins and gravestones were removed. Number 3. The Principality of Sealand Now this isn't exactly a place being bought at insane prices, but the owner of Sealand pretty much has the same values as the owners of many nail houses in China. Located in the North Sea, about 12 kilometers off the coast of England, Sealand is a self-declared sovereign state. It's an offshore platform originally built during to defend the coast of England from German attacks. But after the war ended, the platform was abandoned and left to rust in the sea. In 1967, a man named Roy Bates had a brilliant idea. He saw the platform and thought it would be the perfect place to start his own country. So Bates declared the platform an independent state, and thus the Principality of Sealand was born. Bates, who later became known as Prince Roy, designed a flag, wrote a constitution, and even minted his own currency. He declared himself and his family members the royal family of Sealand and claimed that the platform was a sovereign nation. The British government didn't recognize Sealand's sovereignty, but they also didn't do anything to stop Bates and his family from living on the platform. There were still succeeding efforts to force the only residents on the platform to leave, but to this day, they don't plan on evacuating the area. Then again, living in a small country ruled by yourself sounds like the ultimate dream, doesn't it? Number 2. Wuping House This is not the first nail house featured in this video, but this is definitely the most distinct. In fact, the homeowner, Wu Ping, even became a celebrity of some sort because she refused to sell the property. While the Chinese government and developers were carrying out construction work for a new shopping mall, Wu Ping's house became a significant obstacle in the middle of the construction site. Even though 281 families in the area were offered a new house or monetary compensation to relocate, Wu Ping stood her ground and refused to move in 2004. Despite being urged by the government to leave her house and restaurant, she refused to comply. On April 4, 2007, Wu Ping's house in central Chongqing, China was demolished, and she and her family received a settlement of 1 million yuan and a new apartment. Her story attracted international attention and became a source of inspiration for Chinese citizens to resist developers who were sometimes backed by the government. Wu Ping was determined to receive more compensation than she was offered, which resulted in her becoming a celebrity in China. She and her husband have now settled into their new flat, and she's made numerous appearances on various TV shows. Number 1. In the Fast Lane In a striking display of resistance against developers, a Chinese homeowner in the Luotuo neighborhood of Zhanghai District in Ningbo, East China's Zhejiang province, has refused to sell their house to the developers of a new motorway. The development project was planned to pass through the owner's property, but the owner has refused to be moved. As a result, the construction of the motorway has had to split in two, going around the homeowner's house. The homeowner has remained unidentified, and according to Chinese media, has been considering whether or not to move for several years. Despite this, the homeowner has not allowed the house to be touched during the construction process. Contrary to popular belief, 
the owner is not holding out for a better compensation package. Instead, there's reportedly a dispute within the family about what to do with the compensation they've been offered, as well as where they will live if they do sell the property. The homeowner's actions have drawn attention to the ongoing standoffs between Chinese homeowners and local officials, who are often accused of offering too little compensation to vacate neighborhoods for major redevelopment projects. This incident is just one example of the resistance some Chinese homeowners are putting up in the face of such projects. So what do you think of these cool houses? Let me know what you think about these unique properties and their stubborn owners in the comments down below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on the screen right now, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everybody!